so now we've got a very exciting session. It's called Question and Answer. So are there any questions? Yes. <clears throat> you mentioned that we need to take a shower every day. Yes. Uh, in my experience, if I take a shower every day, I got a dry skin. So you mean uh, taking a shower with or without the soap? That's a good question, with or without the soap. I think that when you use soap, it should only be used to the areas that probably greatest need, which is usually armpits and crutch. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, my, my morning swim after my exercise, especially when I'm perspiring a lot, I just dive in the water and I just rub the areas. I don't take soap into the creek. So I don't think I ever soap my arms or the outside. Water is enough. Unless I've got dirt on me from being in the creek. So there's, I mean, from being in the garden. So the, um, that is true. The, 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 the soap on the outside, if you soap your whole body up every shower, your skin will get very dry. So only soaping in the areas of need, yes? And soap also removes the vitamin D that is built up uh, if you're out in the sun. That is true. Vitamin D, once you've been in the sun, it needs two hours to develop in your skin. So if you have a shower and wash your body with soap all over, you won't access your vitamin D because the sun's rays hit the skin and they convert a form of <coughs> cholesterol just under the skin to vitamin D. So you need those oils. Yes? When you are all day outside in the garden and exercise, do you, do you need an exercise more? To do, like do you right need now. exercise if you're out in the garden? Well, what's important with exercise is getting aerobic. That's getting that heart beating. And if you're doing, if you're hoeing the garden, you, you will certainly get that. But if your garden activities is just squatting down, weeding, and you're not getting that aerobic, then maybe they're the days you will need to also do the aerobic. Yes? You talked about the bone <coughs> and uh, one of the way to remove this is to starve. What about the charcoal? Can we uh, use the charcoal to cleanse the mold in our body? Can we use the charcoal to uh, eliminate the mold in our body? Well, the charcoal will only cleanse what it touches. So it's really only going into the gastrointestinal tract. Whereas the herbs that I mentioned, they will go into the blood and to the tissues. Okay. Yes? With the vitamin D, you were saying it takes two hours to take it in the, in the skin. How is it if people put afterwards a sunscreen on it? So that wouldn't help either. No, it would not. I don't um, advocate sunscreen. The rays that touch the skin that are converted into vitamin D are UVB, UV ultraviolet B rays, and the sunscreen blocks all the UVB rays. Personally, I never use sunscreen. If I'm going to be out in the sun for a long period, I'll have a big hat on and I will have a long sleeve shirt on. So ideally, you, you use other things rather than the sunscreen. Because re read the label on the sunscreen packet. It's got a lot of chemicals in it. And what do they say? The bigger the name, the scarier or the more toxic it is. And again, it's not hard to go to Safari and, and punch in those <coughs> names and find out exactly what they are. Yes? Daily bathing applies also for little babies, right? Daily bathing for little babies, absolutely. It's a wonderful hydrotherapy treatment. Babies usually sleep well uh, after the bath because our body is throwing off waste. Whether we're doing strenuous exercise or not, is, it is throwing off waste every day. Yes? <coughs> yeah. Did you use uh, salt uh, on your potatoes and so? It said, did you say uh, you use it generously or not? Generously. Uh, I use salt generously. Yeah. <laughs> I love salt. <laughs> and it brings the flavour out in, out in food. And the Bible talks about 
using salt. <laughs> I'm just thinking of arguments I've heard about salt, not that I believe it or just uh, talking with other people. Um, there's the argument that salt is actually like uh, it's from stone and that's not digestible. And, and then also that it should rather be in the soil, so the plants that we eat take up those minerals and that we get it that way. Um, what would you say? So when they say salt should be in the soil, we're looking at minerals. So it's actually great to water your garden with seawater once a month because of the minerals. In Australia you can buy sea salt, we can buy maxi crop, which are quite smelly liquids, but they're really just seaweed, seaweed broken down, which is incredibly high in minerals. So it's all about minerals. And if you were to cook some legumes and not put, an, put salt in, they're, they're inedible. Mm -hmm. And if you put too much salt in it, it's also not nice. <coughs> so you can overdo it, absolutely and you can also underdo it. The bad name has come from sodium chloride, which is, see, as you'll see when I talk about salt, seawater is 82 min 92 minerals, and 30% is sodium, 50% is chloride. So they're the first crystals formed when the, sea wa when the water's evaporated from seawater. So they are scooped up and used but they are very harsh minerals. If you were to inject sodium chloride straight into the bloodstream, the person would die. And sodium chloride is so strong, it kills the taste buds. That's why people that have a lot of sodium chloride have a lot of sodium chloride. Have you noticed? They sprinkle it on everything. They don't even taste the food before they put it on. That's because those strong, harsh minerals um, kill the taste buds. God sodium chloride in nature with all the other minerals and they buffer. They buffer the harshness of sodium chloride and so they are very digestible in, in that balanced form. So we can buy it as Celtic salt and we can buy it as Himalayan salt. <coughs> yes? I'm just wondering, can I make a comment relating yes. to what you did uh, present yesterday? Yes. Yeah. I'm just going to share an experience about the medicine and what the medicine sometimes I've done at a personal level. I was given an an April and a, a tablet for against high blood pressure between 2010. By 2014, I was I could feel my heart pumping outside my body, and 2015 I had to undergo a heart surgery because my heart was enlarged. And uh, the cardiologist, the major cardiologist in the Uppsala Academic uh, Hospital wrote, I had to ask my journal afterwards, he wrote that that tablet is the one which uh, caused the enlargement mm -hmm. of my heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There were many people who said I should follow and, you know, mm -hmm. take to go, but I didn't know. I didn't feel I had that energy and mm -hmm. all this. Now, thank you for that story, but notice what our sister said, she did not know. And that's why it's a good idea, any advice you're given, you say, thank you for your advice, I'm seriously going to consider it. And you need to, to look at your options. But I do realise that from a young age we've been told that the doctor knows and he knows best and he will advise. There are some excellent doctors, there's no doubt about that. Some, I have some good friends that are doctors. But the problem is this attitude in, in our culture is to almost put them up a little too high that they can, can not do wrong. It's like my friend, her, her brother's a chemist and he will not take any drug <laughs> and he's a chemist. He says, no, I, I see what they do and I know what they do. So. It's important to investigate and acknowledge that there's a problem and find out what can be done to work with the body's own healing powers to actually conquer that problem, which is what God did, which is the way God made us. And I find my biggest teachers are the people I help. <laughs> it's like, you know, that, that is a powerful story and you have a story now and as you go through as medical missionaries, your stories are your powerful stories. And 
in Revelation 12, it says they came, overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. So the more you do this, the more stories that, that you will get. And those stories basically are illustrations of uh, how these things work. It was a very sad story when I was working in the Bronx in 2004. There, it was 450 church and the lead singer in the youth choir had the most amazing voice. And she came to me, she was a little overweight, she said, I have an enlarged heart. And she's on all this medication for her enlarged heart and she's 19. So I, I went through her history and I found out that her periods had stopped when she went through a crisis and she was given an experimental <coughs> drug. And that experimental drug enlarged her heart. And now she was on medication for the enlarged heart. Whoa, that is so hard. And I also noticed she didn't like drinking water. So I said, do you know you don't have to drink a whole glass at once? <laughs> you can sip it all through the day. And that's where we need to come in as medical missionaries. If you get some resistance in what you're explaining, then work out how they can implement it. But the saddest part of this story is two weeks later they found her dead. She was 19 and that they acknowledged it was the medication that had killed her. Very, very sad story. Very sad story. But they're, they're illustrations to show that there is only one way that heaven approves in healing. And that is the way that works with the body's healing processes. It makes no sense to go against them. That's why remember Hebrews 10, 35, cast not away therefore thy confidence in the which is great recompense of reward. And I'm sure there are you know, people who have experienced the reward of working with the body. And also just waiting, waiting to let the body heal. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, uh, since we talked about salt earlier, um, what is your experience with magnesium oil? My experience with magnesium oil is very positive. In fact, the research is showing that magnesium oil, which is applied topically to the outside of the body, is more effective and picked up more efficiently than taking the magnesium by mouth. And there can be a time for both. Our massage therapists always have magnesium oil. See, magnesium is a muscle relaxant. And so whenever you've got tight muscles, cramping muscles, <coughs> the magnesium oil can be in very effective. And for people with restless legs, we advise they have a hot Epsom salts bath if that's not possible to apply the magnesium oil uh, it's, on the it's outside. The pain. Yes, yeah, yeah. it does, okay. it does, it does. Because cramping muscles can cause pain. Mm. So whenever there's cramping muscles, you can apply the magnesium oil. I have yes? experience of the, using the magnesium oil. Mm. It's really true. Yes, it is true. That's why it's very good for everyone to try this on themselves. <laughs> and, and then they've got a story. Yes? Yeah, when you have the restless leg syndrome, should they take it during the day or should they do it at night time when they have the problem? With uh, ideally, before they go to bed, because that's often when the restless legs start, so just before they go to bed or people that, you know, the hot Epsom salts bath. Two things relax muscles, that's moist heat and magnesium. So in an Epsom salt bath, you've got them, them both there. But um, Dr. Neil Nedley, I went to a, a seminar by him and he said, exercise those legs. You've really got to exercise those legs. So the exercises that are particularly working the legs are rebounding, trampolining, uh, exercise bike, also swimming. Swimming's quite good. So the legs have to get some exercise. How, how much do you use of this magnesium oil? I mean, uh, spray? Um, well, I guess you, you, you would just feel your way with that. Obviously, if you put too much on, it's going to be dripping everywhere, but you can certainly rub it in and you really can't overdo it. But do you do it in the whole body, just on the legs? No, just the legs. Just the legs, okay. Yeah, just the area that's, that's feeling it. And once is enough and don't go to the uh, 
often it is. If someone wakes with them at the night, they can certainly apply it again. But I've also had, you know, women with period pain where their stomach's cramping, people with um, uh, diarrhoea or muscle pain, they can apply it to the abdomen and it can relax the cramping there. Pardon? Growing pains? Uh, growing pains is a little different. Yeah. Growing pains can perhaps be a little uh, bone, bone too. But you can certainly try the magnesium oil for growing pains. It's worth a try. Yes? Uh, I had restless legs and I thought, well, I have been drinking quite a lot of water. Perhaps I should uh, take salt and that helped. Hmm. Yes. Now that's a very good point. And the reason why you were helped with that is that in the Celtic salt there are three magnesiums. There's magnesium chloride, magnesium bromide and magnesium sulfate. So that's why. And, and people with restless legs, they might even find that, uh, that doing that, taking the salt before every glass of water. Yes? Um, when you say that the skin is breathing, do you mean that it takes up oxygen like the lungs? Not as much, not as much. But there's the very sad story of the little girl who was painted gold for a play and she died. And when they filmed, I was reading the report on the James Bond movie, Goldfinger, apparently they had to paint the model gold for this scene. And I was reading they had to paint half her body, shoot that, take that off, paint the back part of her body, then shoot that. Another illustration that you can't cover the whole body because it does breathe, not quite as much oxygen as, as the lungs are taking in, but it needs to breathe, it needs air. But are you saying that, that the people who are having tattoos all over the place, that the, the skin cannot breathe? Uh, a bit difficult to breathe in those areas, yeah. Okay. What about the dry brushing or skin? The dry brushing of the skin is very effective because the top layer of your skin is dead. You've got several layers to the skin, but the top is dead. So exfoliating the skin can help to, to, uh, to get rid of that dead layer. In our steam sauna, we have th the guests have three hots and three dives in the creeks. And in the middle sauna, we have a container of Epsom salts crystals. And they rub that onto their skin in the second steam for three reasons. One is exfoliation, rubbing off that dead layer. Number two is because magnesium is a water-hungry molecule, when they put it on their skin, it's going to pull more perspiration out. And the third reason is when you're perspiring a lot, you do lose some magnesium. So putting it on your skin, it'll absorb some of the magnesium. So some people that do uh, fasting at home and want to stimulate the body losing more or taking out more waste, they will have a hot Epsom salt bath at night and that Epsom salt certainly can help to pull waste out. Yeah? Is magnesium also a recommendation for people with uh, fibromyalgia? Uh, it can be. It, it certainly can be. Mm. Fibromyalgia, there are a few theories behind that. <laughs> Some of the theories are build up waste in the tissues. Some theories are uh, fungal growth in the tissues, uh, there, you know, there, there are a few theories. Yes? Uh, there's several people that talk about eating seaweed, mm -hmm. and you mentioned that the heavy metals drop down to that level, mm -hmm. Does it, and the plastic too, is it uh, safe? Or? Um, that is a question mark with seaweed. I'm hesitant, and I'm also hesitant with kelp because there's hardly a part of our seas to know that aren't polluted, that, that is true. But you get some of less pollution and you get the rolling of the waves which can purify the water. So in the Celtic salt, you, you know, the sea salts, you won't get the chemicals, but uh, you, they're certainly in the sea life, in the fishes, and quite possibly in the seaweed. So. I guess if you do buy seaweed, you want to look for organic seaweed, which means that they've, they've uh, collected it from a fairly safe area and hopefully even tested it that it doesn't have the chemicals. But the highest concentration of the chemicals will be in uh, the sea life, 
So especially you see your sea's vacuum cleaners are, are the oysters, the crabs, the lobsters and the prawns. They are, they're certainly taking it in. And you know, the Bible considers them unclean anyway. Yeah. And uh, we shouldn't be eating them. Uh, are all foods um, and the mold with foods equal? Like bread, that's very obvious, it's like the other thing, but I'm thinking of a carrot. Sometimes it gets a black spot on it. Yeah. You can't just take it off. It looks fine, the rest of it. Yeah. Yeah, it is hard, especially when you've grown the pumpkin and only one little bit's mouldy, but we just we just throw it all, so ideally. It's all bad well, the sourdough bread is the better bread. And the sourdough bread does not have mould in it. The sourdough bread is a combination of wild yeast and lactobacillus. And what happens is the lactobacillus consumes the wild yeasts. Mm -hmm. So the sourdough bread is the very best bread the to use. It's all bad, so if it's like yeah. a tiny bit. Yeah, it's your best, the best to discard yeah. if you see any traces there. Because Ellen White does comment on that, that fruit and vegetables, yeah. if it's... We have a saying, if in doubt, chuck it out. Yeah. <laughs> Discard it. Make, makes good compost. <laughs> yes? Uh, you talk about the lichens. <coughs> I usually cook a large portion of beans. Yes. And keep it in the refrigerator. Yes. So around two or three times a day we eat the beans. Yes. Breakfast. Yes. Is there any advantage of it? Uh, not really. Even not really. the sprout, we eat the two, three yeah, times One has to be very careful of sprouts because sprouts can mould very easily because they're in such a moist environment. Um, I've got a friend and he always puts a little bit of colloidal silver in the water he washes his sprouts with. I went to a seminar one day and, and the presenter had sprouts that he'd bought from different shops, supermarkets, every one of them tested positive for mould. But I so, found it myself. Yeah, and you, and, yeah. and you can certainly, they wash can certainly mould in your house. If you're sprouting, you should wash them four times a day. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I wash it in a running water. And if it's in summer, ideally the sprouts are in the fridge because the warm moisture can do it. But a piece of information for you, and I got this out of Nutrition Almanac. Nutrition yeah. Almanac is the book that tells you what's in every food. They do a new, uh, a new copy of Nutrition, new edition about every four or five years. One cup of cooked lentils is 15 grams of protein. One cup of lentil sprouts is 6.5 grams of protein. So when you sprout the legume, you bring it back to a plant. So you, you're lessening the, uh, the, the protein levels. Because I've heard raw food advocates say, eat the sprouts instead of the cooked because, you know, you get more protein. But it, it's actually not true. You'll get more uh, minerals and you'll get a few more vitamins because you're back to a plant. Mm -hmm. But... Regarding protein, you get more protein from your cooked legumes. Yes? We talked about cancer before and uh, the programs for cancer, recommendations for cancer. Does it vary between different types of cancer? For example, lung cancer versus blood cancer? Yes, it certainly does, depending on the type. So if someone has breast cancer, it's very important that they balance the hormones. And same with prostate cancer. And with uh, breast cancer, there might be some poultices and some specifics you would use for that. So you're right, it, it can vary. But with lung cancer, what we advise is mixing a teaspoon of sodium bicarbonate and a cup of water together and getting a spray bottle and spray and <gasps> breathe it in. Because remember, wherever sodium bicarbonate touches, it gives a wake, wave of alkalinity to cancer, and cancer loves the acid environment. And there can be a little bit of um, uh, mastering that one. <laughs> but see how simple that is? So simple. 
And with lung cancer, the oil pulling is important to help uh, release waste from the lungs. <coughs> also different poultices. So you are right, different cancers um, require slightly different things. But the one common denominator is what I gave you before. You've got to get that sweet down, get the glucose levels down, alkalize uh, the tissues and get the oxygen levels up. Yes? Which proportions from the soda, uh, soda by Carbonate. and water when you... One teaspoon of sodium bicarbonate to one cup of water. Antibiotic drink. What was in it again? Yeah. <laughs> I did. I said it fast because we're going to look at it in more detail when we okay. when we go through the other. So maybe unless anyone needs it today, <laughs> it's uh, yeah. You always remember by uh, six ingredients: ginger and garlic, uh, lemon and cayenne pepper, and honey and a drop of eucalyptus oil. One lady said to me, Barbara, but it says on the label that eucalyptus oil must never be taken. I said, we're not advising you drink half a cup. <laughs> Do you know, there's, there's common sense there. It's one drop. <laughs> and do you know why they say that? Because in 1976, I remember it well, my first baby was born and I was listening to the radio that a little boy in Tasmania You've heard of Tasmania, it's that little island right down the bottom of Australia. It's considered one of the states. A little boy drank some eucalyptus oil and went into a coma. So they banned eucalyptus oil. How many die from alcohol and that hasn't been banned? Anyway, there was such an uproar that they eventually legalised it. But every bottle of eucalyptus oil you buy now, it's got poison, do not take, not fit for human for mm. consumption, special lids that children can't open. Mm. And it's because of that little boy. He didn't die, but he went into a coma. And common sense tells us, you don't drink that. <laughs> I'm always interested in this one. Why? Yeah. Why, why, why? why don't they ban alcohol? Well, they make too much money out of yeah. it. And do you know in Australia when the lockdown happened and only essential services were open, do you know what they considered an essential service? The alcohol shops. <laughs> and yet the churches had to lock down. I, I would consider the churches essential. Mm. Um, I have a question for the fungus because you said some sorts of fungus or types of fungus, uh, it takes about but it could take about 10 years to get rid of them. What makes them so resistant? Well, the reason why it would be in the body 10 years is because it's getting well fed. <laughs> so much depends on that. So when people say to me, how long will this take? And I say, well, it depends. All depends how chronic the, the condition is. All depends on how long it's been there. All depends on how diligent the person is to do what you've got to do to eliminate it. So I'll give you a story. And this story was a true story because um, a girlfriend of mine met the wife of the man this happened to. So it's in uh, Queensland in New South Wales and there was a silo where they store grain and the inside of the silo was white because there was water damage. What's the white? It's mould. So these three men were told to go in and clean the walls of the silo. So they opened the door, had a look. Two of the men said, hmm, we're going to get some protective clothing for this. And the third man said, huh, we don't need protective clothing. And he got a shovel and he began to chip off the mould lining the wall of the silo. So it was about 10, 15 minutes when the two other men came back and they looked like they were about to walk on Mars. In other words, it's acknowledged how toxic this is. When they opened the door, their friend was lying on the ground. They ran to him. He was dead. So when he 
chipped like that, he breathed in through skin, just a swallow, it's everywhere, and he had an anaphylactic shock because it was so toxic and he died. And that, that, that uh, story actually went into the newspaper. That's why I wrote the book Self Heal by Design. Most people don't realise how toxic mould is. But it was, it was like, he chipped it off, it was solid. So when you chip it off, there was quite a build up there, of course. It's, it's everywhere. Now the worst thing you can clean mould with is bleach because when bleach and mould get together they create a very toxic mix. My daughter told me there was a newspaper article in the US where a lady went into a mouldy bathroom, all the windows and doors were shut and she cleaned it with mould and they found her dead. Hmm. Most people clean mould with bleach but it's usually a little bit and the windows are open. So what can you clean mould with? What kills it very effectively is vinegar and also sodium bicarbonate. So what you do is you clean it with vinegar, sodium bicarbonate, and then when it's clean, but what I suggest, if it's quite bad, you go in, mask up, remember this stuff's toxic, spray the whole area with vinegar and walk straight out. You can come back in 10 minutes, it'll be dead, and then you wipe it up. But if you spray straight away and wipe, the spores will go into the air and you'll get a dose of it. And then wipe the whole area over with a damp cloth that's got a couple of drops of uh, clove, clove essential oil, that's very strong antifungal. And then go and ring up the builder or the plumber and find out why it was there. Unless it was very damp and it was closed up for six months, then it's obvious why it's there. Vinegar and sodium bicarbonate, would you use them together because don't they uh, neutralize each other? Well, you get this great reaction yeah. and in that, all that fizzing up, you can, you can scrub it. But does but it have the, um, detoxifying effects? If it's not uh, yeah. yeah, but usually you can use it separate. separate. Yeah. And it's a good, great way to clean your teeth. Just dip, have a little bowl of sodium bicarb, dip your toothbrush in. In fact, Toothpaste, you know how they're chalky? They're mostly sodium bicarbonate. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> and if you want the lice peppermint, just put a drop of peppermint oil in. Yeah? When you have a yeast infection, should you also not eat bread? You can eat the sourdough, but not yeast bread, because yeast bread, that yeast will feed it. So if someone has a yeast problem, all yeast, Terilla yeast, brewer's yeast, marmites, vegemites, yeast spread, all the yeast must go. Brewer's yeast? I never use brewer's yeast. You can't kill yeast. <laughs>